Hello there, everyone. That was a quick turnaround, wasn't it? And we're back on a new stream. And in this stream, we're going to learn more about transcendentalism more generally. Earlier on in our study of Henry David Thoreau's Walden, who is an eminent transcendentalist, perhaps one of the founding fathers of transcendentalism, our own Caroline Songbird mentioned about this term, transcendentalism, which I was half aware of, I had an opinion about, but in one of the streams, I can't remember which one, sadly, I pulled up the Wikipedia article of transcendentalism and read it, and it resonated very deeply with me. And so I've picked up this Cliff Notes, Thoreau, Emerson and Transcendentalism, in order to learn a little bit more about it. And so I thought, rather than be selfish and read and learn about transcendentalism all on my own, well, why not turn the stream on and share it with you and we can learn together. So that's what we're doing today. We've just finished reading The Village from Walden. It was a rather short chapter. And of course, I was rabbit in a way, so it went on a hell of a lot longer than it needed to. But hey, why not? We're all here to talk and learn and grow. And so, yes, today we're going to learn about transcendentalism more generally, how it was founded, um, again, what we will cover in this stream to just whet your appetite if you're watching on Catch Up. An introduction, generally, transcendentalism, what is it? An introduction, the major tenets, the reason for the rise of the movement, forms of expressing transcendental philosophy and the lasting impact of the movement. So there's about 11 pages in this introduction. If you're watching on Catch Up or if you're here and you're interested in moving forward and learning about this, we the next part would be the introduction to the Times, a section on Ralph Waldo Emerson, a section on Henry David Thoreau, and that's it. So if you want to hear about that, the Times when this um, philosophy was founded about Ralph Waldo Emerson and our very own Henry David Thoreau, who um, is the author of Walden and is impacting us all very deeply with his wisdom and philosophy, you must let me know in the comments, tell me, and we'll try and uh, schedule another stream. So <clears throat> just quickly, if you're looking forward to learning today about transcendentalism, be sure to like the video, subscribe, consider sharing the show with any transcendentalist friends. And here we go with an introduction. Transcendentalism, an introduction. And this is the introduction to the introduction. <laughs> so, and you're very welcome. Mark, thanks for coming back. It's lovely to see you, my friend. Laurie's back and says, got it. Yippee. And Caroline says, thanks for this offering. And thank you, uh, Caroline, for um, introducing us all, I suppose. It's Caroline who really wanted Walden to come to the channel. And so over a long enough time period, um, it, will, it will come. Anyone who's ever uh, subscribed and become a clubber uh, and they're desperate for a book... Yes, it won't come straight away because I can't just read everyone's request. But if you're there constantly, you know, um, constantly reminding me, then it will go in a poll and it will win eventually. And if it doesn't win, I don't think Walden ever won. But Caroline was so sincere and interested that <clears throat> here we are. We just read chapter eight. And I must say I'm very thankful because it's a wonderful a piece of literature, not to mention transcendentalist philosophy. So, <clears throat> Caroline the Scribe says, I have the PDA of this, PDF of this pulled up if you want anything noted. So, you're working overtime today, Caroline. I like it. <clears throat> Let's read. Introduction, as I just said. New England Transcendentalism was a religious, philosophical and literary movement that began to express itself in New England in the 1830s and continued through the 1840s and 1850s. 
Although Ralph Waldo Emerson, Amos Bronson Alcott, and others among the transcendentalists lived to old age in the 1880s and beyond, by about 1860 the energy that had earlier characterised transcendentalism as a distinct movement had subsided. For several reasons, transcendentalism is not simple to define. Transcendentalism encompassed complex philosophical and religious ideas. Its tenets were tinged with a certain mysticism which defies concise explanation. Moreover, significant differences of focus and interpretation existed among the transcendentalists. These differences complicate generalizations about the movement as a whole. And it's quite nice. If you haven't said it out loud yet, you should try it because it's quite a nice thing to say. Transcendentalism. Give it a go. You'll like it. Hello there, King Arjun. I'm glad that you love everything that we're reading. It warms my heart to know that, uh, yeah, you're, you're enjoying whatever we read. And it's lovely to have you, King Arjun. I do hope you're well. Henry David Thoreau himself pointed out the difficulty of understanding transcendentalism in his well-known journal entry for March 5th, 1853. And this is a quote, quote, the Secretary of the Association for the Advancement of Science requests me to fill the blank against certain questions, among which the most important one was what branch of science I was specially interested in. I felt that it would be to make myself the laughing stock of the scientific community to describe to them that branch of science which specially interests me, inasmuch as they do not believe in a science which deals with the higher law. So, I was obliged to speak to their condition and describe to them that poor part of me which alone they can understand. The fact is, I am a mystic, a transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. Now that I think of it, I should have told them at once that I was a transcendentalist. That would have been the shortest way of telling them that they would not understand my explanations. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. End quote. Transcendentalism clearly eluded succinct definition in Thoreau's time as much as it does in our own. Moreover, the transcendentalists were only loosely connected with one another. They were not a cohesive, organised group who shared a formal doctrine. They were distinct and independent individuals who accepted some basic premises about man's place in the universe. Transcendentalism flourished in the intellectual centres of Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and because of Ralph Waldo Emerson's presence in nearby Concord as well. Emerson moved to Concord in 1834 and bought a home on the Cambridge Turnpike in 1835. His essay, Nature, a systematic exposition of the main principles of transcendentalism, was published anonymously in 1836. His publication sparked a period of intense intellectual ferment and literary activity. And I'm sure I have Emerson's essay, Nature, in my collection, and so if you want to hear that read, maybe after we finish Walden, let me know and uh, keep reminding me, and we'll read that as well. I think Emerson also has a, a book or an essay, Civil Disobedience. I think that's Emerson. Correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, but uh, Civil Disobedience sounds somewhat more radical than nature. But you need a bit of, of a radical spark in you, I think. <clears throat> Although it was based in part on ancient ideas, the philosophy of Plato, for example, transcendentalism was in many ways a radical movement threatening to established religion. Some people opposed transcendentalism vigorously. One of its most reactionary critics was Harvard professor Andrew Norton, who attacked Emerson's Divinity School Address in 1838, and who went on to produce a piece titled Discourse on the Latest Form of Infidelity in 1839. The latest form of infidelity to which Norton referred was, of course, transcendentalism. Emerson was, as a high-profile writer, lecturer, and editor of the transcendental periodical The Dial, central among the transcendentalists. 
In addition to Emerson and Thoreau, others involved in the movement included Amos Bronson Alcott, philosopher, educator and Concordian, Margaret Fuller, early feminist author and lecturer, one of the editors of The Dial, James Freeman Clark, Unitarian minister, author and editor, Theodore Parker, Unitarian minister and abolitionist, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, teacher and educational reformer, writer, editor and social reformer, one of the publishers of The Dial, George Ripley, Unitarian minister, editor and founder of the Brook Farm Community, Orestes Brownson, editor, reviewer and contributor of Essays to the Christian Examiner and to his own Boston Quarterly Review, William Henry Channing, Unitarian minister and editor of the Western Messenger and other journals, Christopher Pierce Cranch, Unitarian minister, editor of the Western Messenger, poet and artist, Converse Francis, Unitarian minister, biographer of John Eliot and historian of Watertown, William Henry Furness, Unitarian minister, theologian and author, Frederick Henry Hedge, Unitarian minister, scholar, author, editor, lecturer and professor of ecclesiastical history and of German at Harvard, and Jones Very, poet, tutor in Greek at Harvard, and after he proclaimed himself the second coming of Christ, a resident at McLean's Asylum. <laughs> forgive, forgive me finding that rather funny. These individuals, all of whom devoted serious thought to the major concepts of transcendentalism, were educated intellectual people. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and Caroline's cleared up my um, my confusion and says, I think civil disobedience is Thoreau and self-reliance is Emerson, uh, which Graham likes. So uh, Laurie, B, Laurie likes it too, uh, and Thoreau was civil disobedience. So forgive me. Uh, thanks for the fact checking. And we will read that very soon, no doubt. And it, it would appear, I think... Uh, over three quarters. Hello there, Jean Green. Welcome. Peace to you, my friend. Over three quarters, four fifths of those names were Unitarian ministers. And so I don't know if any of you guys know about the Unitarian Church, but it would seem that they're closely related transcendentalism and Unitarianism. And perhaps we'll learn more about that in a moment. But the next section is called The Major Tenets of Transcendentalism. Above all, the transcendentalists believed in the importance of a direct relationship with God and with nature. Emerson wrote in his essay Nature that the foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face, we through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? <laughs> if you want to put that one in, Caroline, that quote from Emerson there, fantastic, the foregoing generations. Um, I like it. I like it. Theodore Parker spoke of man's relation to God in particular in his powerful sermon, A Discourse of the Transient and Permanent in Christianity, also known as the South Boston Sermon, which he was delivered in 1841. Parker wrote, quote, In an age of corruption, as all ages are, Jesus stood and looked up to God. There was nothing between him and the Father of all, no old world, no sin, or the perverseness of the infant of the finite will. He would have us do the same, worship with nothing between us and God, and we never are Christians, and he was the Christ until we worship as Jesus did, with nothing between us and the Father of all. End quote. Truthers, I think um, also that this was what the, the, the Reformation said, right? The reformist, um, what's the chap's name, Martin Luther, uh, the Protestant Reformation took this position as well, that the Catholics have to go through the, 
the Pope and the church and all these rituals, whereas the Protestants said, no, no, we can have a direct relationship with God. Of course, Martin Luther is very famous for translating the Bible and making it easily accessible to everyone, which allowed people to directly read about God rather than the Latin Mass of the Catholic Church. They would be able to go directly to the source, if you like, which is what the Transcendentalists consider to be worthwhile. And I would agree with that because the only way to learn about a religion is to read its holy book, right? If you've got an opinion about Islam and you've never read the Quran, then you should get rid of your opinion and just put it somewhere else for the time being and don't think about Islam. You know, if you haven't read the uh, the biography of the Prophet or the Hadiths, you know, and you've got an opinion, just throw it away. You know, throw it away. If you haven't read the Bible and you've got an opinion about Christians, throw that away as well. Hello there, Kairul. I'm glad you're enjoying the reading and hello there. <clears throat> Thoreau, our very own Henry David. Thoreau, who was born and lived almost in enti his entire life in Concord, went to live at Walden Pond in 1845 to experience nature directly and intensely and to test his transcendental outlook in the concrete physical world. In the chapter of his book Walden, titled Solitude, which we've read, he wrote of his connection with nature as a very intimate two-way relationship. Quote, The indescribable innocence and beneficence of nature, of sun and wind and rain, of summer and winter, such health, such cheer they afford for ever. Shall I not have intelligence with the earth? Am I not partly leaves and vegetable mould myself? And so if you want to quote that one, Caroline, and I'm just going to check actually that I'm not misspeaking. Did we read Solitude? We did read Solitude, chapter 5. So that's on there. If you want to go and listen to the whole, uh, the whole chapter, go check that out. Thoreau's expression of his essential oneness with nature suggests the concept at the very heart of transcendentalism, that of the oversoul. The Oversoul formed the encompassing framework within which a direct relationship with God and with nature was so essential to the Transcendentalists. Simply described, the Oversoul was a kind of cosmic unity between man, God and nature. Emerson wrote an essay titled The Oversoul, which was included in the first series of his essays published in 1841. In it, he described the Oversoul as, quote, that great nature in which we rest, that unity, that over-soul, within which every man's particular being is contained and made one with all other. We live in succession, in division, in parts, in particles. Meantime, within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. And if you are aware of, again, the Bhagavad Gita philosophy, Platonic philosophy, Neoplatonic philosophy, and even uh, Gurdjieff's very own writings, then in Bhagavad Gita it's called the Atman and the Paramatman, and in Platonism it will be called the World Soul and the individual soul the incarnate soul and in transcendentalism clearly it's called the over soul and the soul in man and here we come to plato again it seems <clears throat> the idea of the over soul had roots in the ancient philosophy of plato whose writings the transcendentalists read and i would if i can just chip in i'd advise everyone to read because they are absolutely wonderful and I would consider them uh, scriptural authorities. It's, it's an unusual thing to consider Plato as scripture, but I believe he was divinely inspired. And if you learn the books and read the books, and if you want somewhere to begin, I've got a, a video on the other channel on Lewis Kirk, I think Plato 
where to begin or where to start. So if you check that out, then you will, um, yeah, you'll find that and, and you can begin if you're interested. <clears throat> We've got a quote from Laurie who says, we keep walking forward and pulling the threads of the tapestry. I just saw a video linking Gobekli Tepe to the Bible and other religious teachings, not sure if it was Islam or Hindu. And I would imagine that they're all interlinked if you go back far enough, right, Laurie? The names come about very recent times. Christ never called himself a Christian, right? I saw a quote the other day, if, if everyone understood Buddhism, there'd be no need for the Buddha. So the Buddha didn't call himself the Buddha, or maybe he did. The Buddha means enlightened one. But the Christ, Jesus the Christ, didn't found the church. That came after he died, you know, 50, 100, 200 years later, the church was founded. So, again, not to digress into a religious... Uh, essay but let's carry on plato the idea of the oversoul had roots in the ancient philosophy of plato whose writings the transcendentalists read did i say that you should read them too <laughs> to the transcendentalists the oversoul was the divine spirit or mind that was present in each and every man and in all of nature it was an all-pervading omniscient supreme mind each particular example of nature or of humanity was a reflection of the divine mind, and the whole of the cosmos could be extrapolated from each particular. In each manifestation of God, man could discover, in encapsulated form, all universal laws at work. The presence of the divine spirit in both nature and the human soul made a direct understanding of God and an openness to the natural world avenues to self-understanding. Self-understanding led to the perception of higher truths. And as we learn in Plato, uh, above the, the door of the temple at Delphi, I believe, know thyself, know thyself. And hello there, Dust, Jonas, so excited about this reading. I'm happy to hear that, um, uh, Jonas. And Caroline says Thoreau was also influenced by the Gita. So maybe I'm a transcendentalist and I didn't know it. Because I'm influenced by Plato and the Bhagavad Gita. So I'm a transcendentalist and I didn't know it. <laughs> maybe that's why I'm so resonate. Thoreau's work resonates so deeply because in my soul, that's what I am. And I just didn't know. I didn't have a term for it. For some of the transcendentalists, social activism was a direct consequence of this sense of cosmic unity. If man is intimately connected with and a reflection of God in the way that the transcendentalists suggested, and if God is good and just, then man is also innately good and just. Evil exists only when man has an imperfect awareness of his essential goodness and godliness. This outlook gave dignity and importance to human activity as manifestations of the divine and fostered a belief in man's power to bring about personal improvement and social change in harmony with God's purposes. Out of this belief arose the transcendentalists' involvement in a variety of reform activities and in social experiments like Brook Farm and Fruitlands, which were utopian communities established in Massachusetts and I'm all for a utopian community also so lots of confirmations <laughs> and in as important as this interrelationship between the particular and the cosmic was to the transcendentalists the process by which the individual could understand the relationship was equally important they felt that neither the received dogma of traditional systems of belief nor formal reasoning would give real insight into truth and morality as expressed in the multiple manifestations of the oversoul. They looked rather to intuitive as opposed to consciously rational thought. James Walker was a Unitarian minister, an editor of the Christian Examiner, a Harvard professor of religion and philosophy, and an influence on the transcendentalists, although not really one of them. 
In 1834, he published in the Christian Examiner an address titled The Philosophy of Man's Spiritual Nature in Regard to the Foundation of Faith, in which he described intuitive thought as the transcendentalists understood it. Walker stated, quote, On what evidence does a devout man's conviction of the existence and reality of the spiritual world depend? I answer, he does not take the facts of his inward experience and hold to the existence and reality of the spiritual world as a logical deduction from these facts, but as an intuitive suggestion grounded on these facts. He believes in the existence and reality of the spiritual world just as he believes in his own existence and reality, and just as he believes in the existence and reality of the outward universe, simply and solely because he is so constituted that with his impressions or perceptions he cannot help it. Mm. Laurie says if I was to get a tattoo it would be... Uh, to thine own self be true and it's always been a motto so yeah i like that know thyself uh so yeah all of these would be very um very powerful things to remember and like we read in last night's chapter of gurdjieff uh beelzebub's tales to bring the conscience from the subconscious into the conscious waking state uh, but I won't go into that. You should listen to chapter 26 that we read late yesterday if you want to learn more about that. Another clear presentation of intuition was written by Francis Bowen, a writer for the Christian Examiner and a critic of transcendentalism, in particular a critic of the emphasis on intuition as opposed to reason. In his review of Emerson's Nature in the Examiner, Bowen characterized the concept of intuition as expressed by Emerson. Quote, Transcendentalism rejects the aid of observation and will not trust to experiment. The Baconian mode of discovery is regarded as obsolete. Induction is a slow and tedious process, and the results are uncertain and imperfect. General truths are to be attained without the previous examination of particulars and by the aid of higher power than the understanding. Truths which are felt are more satisfactory and certain than those which are proved. Hidden meanings, glimpses of spiritual and everlasting truth are found where former observers sought only for natural facts. The observation of sensible phenomena can lead only to the discovery of insulated partial and relative laws, but the consideration of the same phenomena in a typical point of view may lead us to infinite and absolute truth, to a knowledge of the reality of things. Bowen continued on to draw an unflattering analogy between the validity of the transcendentalists, indistinct modes of reflection, loose and rambling speculations, mystical forms of expression and utterance of truths half perceived, and the random luck of the gambler. In their belief that truth was innate in all of creation and that knowledge of truth was intuitive, the transcendentalists were heavily influenced by the thoughts and writings of the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant's Critique of Pure Reason was first published in 1781, his Critique of Practical Reason in 1788. Their use of the term transcendental came from Kant, who wrote, I call all knowledge transcendental which is concerned not with objects, but with our mode of knowing objects, so far as this is possible, a priori that is independent of reason. And I wouldn't have known if I didn't read this, of course, this is how we learn. We don't know everything by intuitive, um, by our intuition, unless maybe we're very high beings. But I wouldn't have said that uh, Immanuel Kant would have impacted the philosophers. So maybe that's a philosopher that I have to go back and read. I think I have a um, copy of his Critique of Pure Reason. It's very hard going, if I remember. But like all of these things, everything is influenced and affected by what came before it. Supposedly, when the Buddha, Prince Siddhartha Gautama, was born, Hinduism was already very old. When Jesus was born, Judaism was already, you know, very well established. When Muhammad was born, you had 
you know, Judaism and Christianity. And he was the world's influenced and affected by these things. So now we moved, we moved to, sorry, transcendentalism, the reasons for the rise of the movement. Transcendentalism flourished at the height of literary and aesthetic romanticism in Europe and America. Romanticism was marked by a reaction against classical formalism and convention and by an emphasis on emotion, spirituality, subjectivity and inspiration. Transcendentalism, inspired by English and European Romantic authors, was a form of American Romanticism. Transcendentalism arose when it did for several reasons. First, it was a humanistic philosophy. It put the individual right at the centre of the universe and promoted respect for human capabilities. The movement was in part a reaction against increasing industrialization in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and against the dehumanization and materialism that frequently accompanied it. In 1814, progressive mill owner Francis Cabot Lowell introduced the power loom into the American textile industry at his Boston Manufacturing Company in Waltham, Massachusetts. The New England transcendentalists consequently grew to maturity at a time when the nature of work and the role of labour were undergoing tremendous change before their eyes and very close to home. And I'll just comment quickly. Obviously, the um, Industrial Revolution is far behind us, right? The Industrial Revolution has embedded itself in our lives, but now we've just sort of come out the end of the, the computing or digital revolution, I would argue, or maybe we're in the midst of it, and now the AI revolution is well underway. And everyone's very scared, you know? If you've ever used ChatGPT, uh, I've used it. It's a very interesting uh, tool, very helpful if you want to do stuff, but it's already taken over certain administrative uh, writing, certain tasks. It can do better than a human and much quicker. So what does that do for these people that have jobs in these lines of work? Who knows, but maybe transcendentalism is, is going to have a comeback. Who knows? <clears throat> Secondly, in the early 19th century, in the period preceding the rise of transcendentalism, dissatisfaction with the spiritual inadequacy of established religion was on the ride. Some early Unitarian ministers, especially William Ellery Channing, who was the uncle of the Concord poet of the same name, had turned away from harsh, unforgiving congregational Calvinism and preached a more humanistic, emotionally expressive and socially conscious form of religion. Channing and a few others among the early Unitarians had a formative influence on the Transcendentalists. However, even the liberal Unitarians remained under the sway of the 17th century English philosopher John Locke, who had explained knowledge as perceivable only by direct observation through the physical senses. Kant's later presentation of knowledge as intuitive was, of course, in direct opposition to Locke. In this sense, transcendentalism was a reaction against the extreme rationalism of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> The dissatisfaction, or even the dissatisfaction, with established religion that affected the transcendentalists is strongly and clearly expressed in Emerson's 1838 Divinity School Address, in which Emerson asked, In how many churches, by how many prophets, tell me, is man made sensible that he is an infinite soul, that the earth and heavens are passing into his mind, that he is drinking for ever the soul of God? Where now sounds the persuasion that by its very melody in paradise is my heart, and so affirms its own origin in heaven? But now the priest's Sabbath has lost the splendour of nature. It is unlovely. We are glad when it is done. We can make, we do make, even sitting in our pews a far better, holier, sweeter for ourselves. Whew. That was amazing. 
And if you, Caroline, want to uh, quote that bit in how many churches up to the soul of God. <laughs> These were critical words and they drew strong negative response, particularly from Andrews Norton, a biblical scholar and professor at the Harvard Divinity School who issued his discourse on the latest form of infidelity in 1839 in response to the ideas Emerson put forth in his address. Like the Divinity School address, Theodore Parker's A Discourse on the Transient and Permanent in Christianity expressed rejection of established religion and religious doctrine. Quote, the stream of Christianity, as men receive it, has caught a stain from every soil it has filtered through, so that now it is not the pure water from the well of life which it offered to our lips, but streams troubled and polluted by man with mire and dirt. If Paul and Jesus could read our books of theological doctrines, would they accept as their teaching what men have vented in their name? Never till the letters of Paul had faded out of his memory, never till the words of Jesus had been torn out from the book of life. It is their notions about Christianity men have taught as the only living word of God. They have piled their own rubbish against the temple of truth, where piety comes up to worship. What wonder the pile seems unshapely and likely to fall, but these theological doctrines are fleeting as the leaves on the trees." I love that as well. What does he say? Um, uh, has filtered through, has caught a stain from every soil it has filtered through. Clearly, Emerson and Parker both envisioned true religion as a personal rather than an institutional connection with the divine. And again, I would agree with that. And so would Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff would say that without efforts, then what are you doing? You're just a Christian in name only. If you just say, I'm a Christian and I go church on Sunday and that's it, you're not, are you? You're not. You need to be reading the Bible, following the uh, the exhortations of Jesus and uh, trying to be a, a good Christian. And if you're not doing that diligently, then you're not really a Christian in my opinion. You can't just say, I am one and that's enough. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, hello there, Russ. Hello, hi from Russ. Oh, Christian wannabe is actually Russ. Hi, Russ. How are you from Tuscan, Arizona? Welcome. A third reason for the rise of transcendentalism was the increasing interest in and availability of foreign literature and philosophy after 1800. Americans were travelling and studying in Europe, and some of them brought books back to America when they returned home. The Reverend Joseph Stevens Buckminster travelled to Europe in 1801, studied biblical scholarship and European methods of biblical interpretation, and returned home with about 3,000 volumes purchased abroad. My man! <laughs> Joseph Stevens Buckminster returned home with 3,000 volumes. My kind of shopping trip. <laughs> oh, I like it, Christian wannabe. Uh, yes, uh, in, the, in the school I was a part of, we would call ourselves aspirant. But first you would be a probationer, and then you were an aspirant. I'm, I'm aspiring to be a Christian, and I suppose that's what Christian wannabe would mean as well, right? Aspiring to Christianity, not I am one, uh, duh, duh. <clears throat> but I, uh, I'm a big fan. I don't know anything about Joseph Stevens Buckminster, but the fact that he went to Europe and bought 3,000 volumes, he's become my best friend. In 1815, George Ticknor and Edward Everett went to Europe to study. They travelled extensively, studied at the University of Göttingen in Germany. In 1817, Everett, because of the first American, or was the first American ever to receive a PhD from Göttingen, and returned to America to take up important academic positions at Harvard, 
tick nor taught foreign literature ever at Greek. And Gottingen, if you've read um, Oppenheimer's biography, that's where he sort of cut his teeth in Gottingham and Gottingham. So that's what comes to mind for me. I have a strong association with that from the reading of Oppenheimer's biography. And so it was clearly well established in 1817. <clears throat> Emerson, significantly, was one of their students. Ticknor and Everett also brought back large numbers of books. Ticknor for his personal library, Everett for Harvard's library. Charles Follen, a German political refugee, was another influential Harvard teacher. In 1830, the first professor of German literature at Harvard, Follen, was very familiar with the writings of Kant. During this period, too, translations into English from European works began to make foreign thought and writing more available. The Reverend Moses Stewart, a professor at the Andover Theological Seminary, was translating grammars of Greek and Hebrew from German in the early 19th century. More significantly, in 1813, Madame de Stal's De Allemange was translated into English under the title Germany. A New York edition came out in 1814. Madame de Stael was a favourite writer of the transcendentalists and was as a key as a kind of archetypal and <clears throat> excuse me. Madame de Stael was a favourite writer of the transcendentalists and was seen as a kind of archetypal intellectual woman. At the same time, many in England and America were exposed to German thought and literature through the writings of Coleridge and Carlyle. Coleridge's Aids to Reflection, first published in 1825, was edited in 1829 by James Marsh, who added a lengthy introduction elucidating German philosophy for American readers. Carlyle wrote a life of Schiller and translated from Goethe. Between 1838 and 1842, George Ripley edited and published in 14 volumes a set titled Specimens of Foreign Standard Literature, which included translations from French and German writings. In 1840, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody opened a circulating library and bookstore on West Street in Boston to supply her comrades with foreign works. Yeah, I know, Laurie, you're telling me. You're telling me, Laurie, I, I'm uh, keeping all this in mind as well. It's fantastic. Among the many foreign authors who influenced the transcendentalists were the German Kant, Fitch, Schleiermacher, Hegel, Schelling, Goethe and Novelis, the French cousin and Constant, the English writers Coleridge, Carlyle and Wordsworth, Plato and English Neoplatonic writers, Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg, and the Eastern writings of Confucius and the sacred texts of Vishnu Purana and the Bhagavad Gita. And just as Laurie was saying, Jeepers, so many references to look up, how about another ten? <laughs> and I, I tell you what, if you were to study all of those, or just one one text from each of those, you'd be a different person. You'd be a different person if you read one text from all of them that I've just read. I'm not going to read that uh, passage again because it's just names and uh, um, the Vishnu Purana and Bhagavad Gita. If you read one from each of those authors, you'd have a changed life and a changed world view. <clears throat> the next section, the forms of expressing transcendental philosophy. The transcendentalists expressed their idealistic philosophy in a variety of ways. They delivered lectures and sermons and wrote essays, articles and books. Emerson, Olcott, Ripley, Parker, Brownson, Fuller, Peabody, Channing, Thoreau, Clark and others participated in meetings of the Transcendental Club, formed in 1836, which served as a discussion group for crystallising their views on aspects of religion and philosophy. 
For four years, 1840 to 44, they had in the quarterly periodical The Dial a vehicle designed specifically for the dissemination of their thoughts, but they also embraced more active as opposed to strictly verbal and textual modes of expression. Teaching and educational reform were major activities to which the transcendentalists devoted their energies. Because the intuitive nature of knowledge formed such a basic part of their outlook, education was naturally a prime area in which to test their philosophy. Bronson Olcott, a progressive teacher, relied extensively on the power of intuition in the classroom. He ran a school at the Masonic Temple in Boston, the Temple School from 1834 to 38. He employed the Socratic dialogue format, or the so-called conversational method, in which he asked questions on a designated topic and gave direction to the course of the ensuing discussion. Learning was an interactive process, intended to uncover innate truth and morality, rather than to instill these values with, from without. Alcott served as superintendent of schools in Concord from 1859 to 65. In 1879, he established the Concord School of Philosophy, an early experiment in adult and continuing education. And just uh, a quick comment on the Socratic method and learning through intuition and conversation, um, how different to the modern school system where you... Um, <laughs> Um, now you just learn by rote. There's a great quote, I think one of my teachers said it, that uh, in school they teach you what to think and not how to think. This little passage that we just read here, the Socratic or so-called conversational method, teaches you how to think. If you know how to think, then you can think about anything. But if all you're doing is learning what to think, learning by rote in order to pass exams i don't know I, i'm not enamored by the uh, educational system i would much rather a more scandinavian approach you know learning by play by investigation and exploration and the socratic method you know why do you think that what about this what about that and uh, Russ says, I know a guy who believes Swedenborg was somehow better than Gurdjieff, maybe less confrontational. I don't know he's better stroke higher. Uh, again, I don't even have any opinion on Swedenborg because I've never read anything about him. I know the name, of course, but uh, I don't know, so... Even if I were to, I don't even have an opinion because I don't know anything at all about him. But if your friend says that and he um, and if he's a similar sort of teacher or has a similar philosophy and method to Gurdjieff, then I'll look into it. Because as I'm sure you all know, if you're regular clubbers, I'm rather fond of Gurdjieff, the man and his teachings. But let's continue learning about the forms of expressing transcendental philosophy. <clears throat> Elizabeth Peabody gave much of her life to teaching and to improving educational methods. She taught school in a number of places, both on her own and with various members of her family, and she served as Alcott's assistant at the Temple School. More importantly, in terms of her lasting impact on education, she went on to establish kindergarten in the United States, beginning with her founding of the first American kindergarten in Boston in 1860. She also conducted conversational series, brackets, discussion groups, similar to those offered by Margaret Fuller. So, um... Uh, who was that? Elizabeth, Elizabeth Peabody founded kindergarten so you've all i'm sure been to kindergarten but did you know that elizabeth peabody the transcendentalist founded it i didn't margaret fuller was both a feminist and in some of her efforts an educator of women a learned woman she organized she organized series of conversations for women in the early 1840s, she held conversational classes at Elizabeth Peabody's West Street home and bookstore. 
Her major work, Women in the 19th Century, grew out of these classes. Like Bronson Alcott, she intended her conversations to stimulate the intuitive process more than to impart factual knowledge. And there you go. That's very well written, what I'm talking about. You know, the, the modern contemporary education system compared to the old ones, right? Uh, she intended her conversations to stimulate the intuitive process more than to impart factual knowledge. That's what we do. We just learn factual knowledge in order to regurgitate it in an exam and get the grades. We don't learn um, the intuitive process or the Socratic method. In addition to education, the transcendentalists expressed their optimism in man's perfectibility in the anti-slavery movement. Most transcendentalists were committed to abolition. Thoreau and, more hesitantly, Emerson, Emerson were galvanizing speakers and writers on behalf of the movement. Theodore Parker spoke out against slavery from the pulpit and wrote on the subject. Bronson Alcott, Margaret Fuller and Elizabeth Peabody were all involved in one way or another. Thoreau formed part of the Underground Railroad in Concord. Other reform concerns that engaged the Transcendentalists included women's suffrage, Native American education and rights, and world peace. Peace man. Some of these movements continued on into the late 19th century, and the enduring Elizabeth Peabody was involved with them until she died in 1894. The establishment of experimental living communities was an important expression of transcendentalism. Bronson Alcott and Charles Lane set up Fruitlands at Harvard, Massachusetts. It lasted from June 1843 to 1844. The Fruitlands Regiment included a vegetarian diet and cold baths in the morning. Quite the rage now if you uh, follow any social media people. Everyone's jumping in the ice bath at four in the morning. Um... <sighs> Bronson Alcott's daughter, author Louisa May Alcott, who endured considerable privation with her family at Fruitlands, satirised the experiment in a piece titled Transcendental Wild Oats. <laughs> Brook Farm at West Roxbury was larger and longer lived than Fruitlands. It was established by George and Sophia Ripley in 1841 to promote a balance between intellectual exertion and manual labour. It continued until 1847 for part of its existence in accordance with the principles of Charles Fourier. Life at Brook Farm included entertainment and social life as well as backbreaking labour. Side by side with farming and other activities related to the necessities, there were the dramatic productions, parties, singing, dancing, picnics, hikes, sledging, skating, reading and literature groups and lectures. And I'm reading at the moment about Gurdjieff's uh, Priory or Priory and Gurdjieff, I don't know if he knows anything about um, the Transcendentalist, but maybe he did and maybe he was inspired by uh, Brook Farm, which I'd love to read more about. Finally, Although Thoreau's life at Walden Pond between 1845 and 1847 constituted a community of only one, his stay there was just as much an experiment in living and an attempt at applied idealism as were Brook Farm and Fruitlands. His Walden, or Life in the Woods... <laughs> based on his experience at the pond, were published in 1854 in the chapter Where I Lived and What I Lived For... On the channel, if you'd like to listen to the full chapter or even on the app, if you don't want to hear me commenting and rabbiting, Thoreau wrote, Men esteem truth remote in the outskirts of the system, behind the farthest star. In eternity there is indeed something true and sublime, but all these times and places and occasions are now and here. God himself culminates in the present moment and we are enabled to apprehend at all what is sublime and noble only by the perpetual instilling and drenching of the reality which surrounds us. 
By living intimately with nature at Walden, Thoreau attained to the higher truths that so concerned all of the transcendentalists. Goodness me. <laughs> and I'm just going to pick out one sentence from that because I mentioned it. Uh, there's a passage towards the end yesterday of chapter 26 of Beelzebub where Beelzebub's talking about the disease of tomorrow. We put off until tomorrow, till tomorrow, that what we should be doing today. And I believe it's referencing more specifically spiritual efforts, awakening, self-remembering, not expressing negative emotions, unnecessary talking, all of these things that Gurdjieff uh, tells in his books. Uh, I was saying that the only time to work is in the present moment, and I'm going to just grab a quote here. Fantastic. Excuse me, I'm going to burp first to um, heighten the uh, intensity. God himself culminates in the present moment. I'm just going to say it again because it's so powerful. God himself culminates in the present moment. And the final little section, just one paragraph, is the lasting impact of the movement. New England transcendentalism as a movement really thrived only for about 25 years. The world was not completely reformed by the words and efforts of its proponents, but people today still read Emerson's Nature and Thoreau's Walden. The importance of these thinkers lies in the endurance of their major writings as American classics worth reading in any period in their influence upon later writers, American and foreign, and in the powerful inspiration that their reform efforts provided to later social movements, notably the impetus given to Mohandas Gandhi and to the American civil rights movement of the 1960s by Thoreau's principle of non-violent resistance to oppressive civil government as expressed in Civil Disobedience, first published in 1849. And that, my friends, is the end of our chapter, but I thoroughly enjoyed that. I don't know about you guys, but that really opened my eyes um, in a big way to transcendentalism more generally. And I'm just going to read that. I've read uh, Mohandas Mahatma Gandhi's biography several times, and of course Gandhi is impressed and inspired by Emerson, Thoreau, and the Bhagavad Gita also. Gandhi would say that his um, Bhagavad Gita was his manual for life. And there the chapter ends by a resistance to oppressive civil government as expressed in civil disobedience. And I'll be honest with you, I am rather worried and scared uh, and a little bit fearful and anxious to read civil disobedience because I am a... Um, an idealist, I suppose, is one of the things I would uh, define myself if I'm here being self-indulgent and saying what I am. I think that the world can be great. I think that all it takes is for every individual to wake up and um, bring in some of these philosophies, whether it be the transcendentalist philosophy, um, whether it be um, Bhagavad Gita, Plato, Gurdjieff, whatever, even the Unitarian Church, right, the Mormons, if everyone adopted something, uh, some humanitarian project, then I think life would be better, and Christian wannabe saying, can't get anyone to read Gurdjieff, even when offered to pay him, but I read him a lot, and uh, there's a lot on the channel, um, Russ, so yeah, go and re-listen, I would say, and, and go deeper. But that is the end of the readings this evening. I think for me, what I've took away from there, you guys let me know before we go, is Emerson's Nature. Emerson's Nature, Thoreau's... I've got the wrong book. Emerson's Nature, Thoreau's Civil Disobedience and Emerson's self-reliance, yeah? So I think there be the next ones on the list. I'm sure I've got them all upstairs in my transcendentalist pile.
but that's all for this evening guys um i'm glad uh ah that's fantastic who was edmund burke caroline can you tell us very quickly or should i read it uh because this is a um this is a wonderful quote that i'm aware of and tim paul often likes to uh say so in the spirit of learning which we're doing here at book club i'm going to just read you uh what wikipedia has to say about edmund burke because caroline puts a quote there um the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is that good men do nothing amen to that edmund burke 2nd January 1729 to 1797, was an Anglo-Irish statesman and philosopher who spent most of his career in Great Britain. Born in Dublin, Burke served as a member of Parliament between 1766 and 94, blah, blah, blah. Burke was a proponent of underpinning virtues with manners in society and of the importance of religious institutions for the moral stability and good of the state. These views were expressed in his A Vindication of Natural Society. And so he's like a philosopher, philosopher politician. And, and uh, yeah, I'm aware of that quote, Caroline Songbird, and I think it's very powerful and very true, as we've seen over the last five or ten years. Many good people said nothing, and the ones that did say something, there wasn't enough of them. And so they were easily swept aside by the machine. But I'm going to leave it there for the for this evening, guys. Um, I really enjoyed tonight's uh, chapters. The short chapter from Walden, The Village, and then a rather lengthy introduction to transcendentalism. And so, of course, we maybe have a better opinion and are slightly more educated than we were before this stream started but i'd still like to read all of those titles that i mentioned emerson's nature and self-reliance and thoreau's civil disobedience maybe i've got all those mixed up uh, from authors and titles but in time we'll read everything that we want here at book club and one book at a time one chapter at a time, one page at a time, one word at a time, and over time, if we're lucky enough, we can get through all the best works here at Book Club. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Like, subscribe, share the show, and I'll see you Sunday for the next one. Guys, look after yourself, have a great weekend, and I'll see you soon. Bye guys. See you.